Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Thanks again for being a part of the conversation and really engaging with what we get to talk about here on the show. We get so many great people coming on to talk about things that, that really matter and the things that we can use in our lives that we can glean from this beautiful game that we love. I'm Phil Dark, your host, and with me is my brother, Paul Jobson. Paul, how you doing, man? Phil, doing great, man. I've I'm always excited about these podcasts, but for some reason, I'm a little bit more excited about this one than most. We finally got a commitment from a, a long time invitation from for this guest. I'm just excited to get to talk to her today. But yeah, man, things are good. I had opportunity to speak to a club up in Dallas this week, and that's always a fun time sharing kind of what we do as far as you know what the recruiting process looks like and that sort of thing. So I got to do that this week. That was fun. And navigating the transition from fall sports to winter sports here at the Jobson House. So can't complain, man. Things are good. And the weather, I mean, you know, it couldn't be better. It's a little <laughs> brisk. You know, people want to know what the weather is in Texas. You know, what kind of I, weather do you yeah. get? Like, it's not 100 yeah. degrees. It's about 56. It's going to get to 70 okay. today. It's it's gorgeous. It's like San Diego, basically. Yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds me of the L.A. story. Remember the L.A. story, the movie with Steve Martin, where he's the weatherman, and he just throws Sunny <laughs> up on the board every day, and then it was the one day when it rained. I feel like that's kind of what we got going on when you do the Texas weather report. Anyway, you know, the other thing that you've had since we uh, last talked, you know, we were talking the last episode we recorded, you had your Warrior Way gala. You know, I'm going to call it a gala. Yeah, uh, like dinner. Yeah. You know, how did that go? Was that, was that great? It was great. A great event. You know, Marcy puts on a great event. It's always just, it's, it's fun. It, it's like uh, having family over. John and Nancy Jackson, they, they hosted for us this year. They're great hosts. They, Great food, great venue, and uh, the people that show up. It, it, it's just really fun because our people who are invited, they all come in and they come in and they can't realize before they got there, like, oh, I can't believe you're here. I didn't know you were here. And the conversations that develop out of that are great. And then uh, the opportunity we had, the generosity that came through that night for Warrior Way Gibbs was incredible and uh, just a really encouraging night. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of Warrior Way, I got my hat on. You know, you got your hat on. And now, today, finally, like we alluded to, we have the other half of the Warrior Way founding team. Um, and I apologize if there's other, you know, percentages, but I think we got the other half. And, you know, this is something that we've talked about doing for a long time, and you just haven't been able to schedule her to be on with us ever. Couldn't, couldn't be able to get it. So how did you finally get this thing to happen that we've been trying to do for so long. Phil, I've been doing chores at the house for months okay. just okay. to try to, to get this done. So, you know, it's hard being, you know, the husband, the dad, the agent to the celebrity yeah. in your household. That's and you true. know what? You just sometimes for the podcast, sometimes you just do what you have to do, man. And, you That's know, it's true. dirty work. It's dirty work. But we yeah. got it done. She's on. And we did. Really excited to, to. And by the way, the percentage is on. It's more like the founding partners of this kind of like 95% Marcy, 5% Paul. So just, okay. there are no other founding members, but it's the percentages are a little off there. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all right. As, well, you'll, folks, as you'll see, as we go here, like we, the passion for this. We, we made it happen. That's all that matters. Yes. Whatever you had yes. to do, I'm glad, grateful that you did it. You know, I could just imagine you slaving away at the house, you know, and <laughs> let, you know, so Folks, we do have Marcy Jobson. You know, we enough enough of the wait, enough of this banter. Marcy Jobson, Warrior Way, former national team, you know, mom of four boys. That's probably the most important and craziest thing you've ever done. And, you know, Marcy, you did found, co-found Warrior Way with Paul. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. And it's fun to hear you two banter in the beginning of this. And I agree with Paul. I, babe, I'm at least 51%, you know, of the warrior way. So. All right. I like yeah. it. I like it. She took the managing, you know, the controlling partner share. I yes. like that. I like that. So, Marcy, you know, we, we started our show every time just hearing your story. Just just briefly share your story. Now, the, the, the little part you yes you have been on for the for the how soccer explains leadership you know people who have been here from the beginning you're like marcy's been on before paul interviewed her way back when that was a that was a off-season talk that we did so 
official interview this is the first one and i'm gonna and i wasn't there then so i don't even i don't even count it it didn't even, it didn't even count so i'm stoked on this that we get to do this so marcy you know just briefly share that story how did you develop your passion for soccer how did you develop your passion for coaching and ministry and leadership and all the things you get to do today well, where where that all begin yeah well i grew up in a family of eight kids so it goes marcy maggie marty minnie mary mike monica mark so i'm the youngest of eight children and just grew up in pretty rowdy home playing a ton of sports but really learning from my siblings and just um having the opportunity to be surrounded by just seven incredible human beings that I was able to to play with in the yard. I was able to to you know watch watch through their experiences. And my sister Maggie always says she's the one right above me that my dad could only afford one pair of soccer cleats, and I was kind of the golden child that got them. But that's not really true. But so you know, as a young kid, I just I really took to soccer. I loved the sport and just had the opportunity as I as I got better through my my younger years. I was trying to decide on colleges and I, I decided to go to University of Wisconsin, which was uh, to play for Greg Ryan, who later became my national team coach. But then he, he ended up leaving when I got to Wisconsin and went to SMU. So I transferred to SMU, played for him there. Man, I feel like that, what you just asked me was a, a pretty long question, but I think back to my early years of playing and everyone always asked me, what was your favorite moment of, of soccer? And it was really high school soccer. I was surrounded by just some great coaches that really were my first lesson in true coaching and pouring into like the all around human being. My high school, were my high school soccer coaches, Tim Daly and Brett Hall and Joe Moreau, just coaches that cared about how you were doing in school and and what was going on in your life. They weren't just concerned of, of winning soccer games. And that gave me a first like lesson into coaching at a young age that it it's um, you know, my mentor always said, to be a great coach, you have to love people. You know, you can't just go and try to try to create wins. And um, I learned that in high school. We won two state championships, which is still to date one of my most memorable people always kind of laugh at that when I give talks I'm like my most memorable moment was you know winning my state championship soccer games but you know it was just such a cult culture of like cohesiveness at our school that was so special to me so that was when kind of my first experience in like building a team was in high school and what it really really was really significant and then and went on to to play at Wisconsin and SMU, had some great experiences at those two different schools. And I think it was really, I always look back at those moments. I went to like two completely different colleges, like, you know, different types of people, different sizes, private and, and public, and just learning at that time how to, how to fit into different types of groups of people, how to lead in different situations you know that was a that was a big moment for me because soon after college I went to play in Germany which was a whole nother experience going to East Germany and and playing pro soccer and not being around family or friends and now having to fit into a culture where I didn't speak the language and to mesh into that team you know and then going on to the national team and playing pro soccer all those different experiences were um, consistently learning how to be a part of a team. So I'm, you know, I'm really grateful for those. And one of the teams that you've been a part of for, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's at this point, it's pretty getting pretty close probably to as long as you were part of team Miller, you're now team Jobson. And so as part of that team, you have been, let's see, head coach, to Paul as an assistant, assistant coach to Paul as head coach and consultant behind the scenes to the team, um, a, you know, all the while uh, doing so many other things. But of those positions, I just, you know, we all want to know what, what was your favorite of those consultant, head coach, assistant coach with Paul? 
You know, the one thing I learned is I never could really let go of being head coach. You know, yeah. like it was like yeah. I tried so hard through through my different phases of coaching. And um, I tried to, you know, in those different times, just just back off and sit back. And um, I always had something to say, some type type of advice to give. And Paul would come home from a game and I'd be like, what were you thinking? You know, <laughs> why'd you sub that girl out or whatever. But um, I think that was the the work that God's done in me through just teaching me what it means to to walk alongside Paul as a wife and as a, you know, a mom of four boys and that my identity isn't just as a soccer player, as a, as a coach, you know, but that is greater than that. And so I think I'm, I'm thankful for kind of the shift that Paul and I had to go through, through our coaching together, because I had to learn, you know, really how to be a great support for him and not just always take the reins. And that's, that's really helped me in, you know, leading people even now, leading a lot of young coaches and Warrior Way and Warrior Way Gives, just how sometimes to just sit and listen and, and not always have to interject when, when I think something should be done a certain way. So, but I'm thankful for all those different times with, with my coaching with Paul. I think we just make a great team when we're together and we're doing a project together is I think when we're both at our best is when we can play off of each other's strengths and weaknesses we always say like when we look back to kind of our most successful times in business or in our industries, it's usually when we are, you know, doing it together. So. No, I love that. And I think that that's something that, you know, we talk about so much on the show and I know we've, we've done the, the disc assessments for you guys and you guys do balance each other and you complement each other really, really well. And I think it's just a great lesson for, for a lot of things, even, even going back to, you know, it was hard to let go of that head coach. That it, it, of course it was, you know, like that's something that you did for not only so long, but to see that and, and, and it's part of you, right? But at the same time, realize when we do this together and together looks different now, but when we do this together, when we complement each other and we allow that to happen and not, not, you know, be continually pining for that control, which I think we right. often so want, right? But to know that you don't need control to influence. Right. You don't need control to be able to still be that team that works together. So, no, I love that. I love that being able to do that. And hopefully that occurs to people out there listening as you're sitting there going, well, maybe you maybe you were in that leadership position. And now you're in a new position where you don't have that title, so to speak. You know, you're still leading at some level. You can lead from the middle, lead from the bottom, you know, as we've talked about even on this show. So and I love that. Now, you know, what did and what did God you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but what did God teach you? through that transition, you know, from head coach to assistant to kind of behind the scenes and now, you know, doing warrior way and full time, all the while, full time mom, homeschool teacher, all these things. Like, what are those lessons that, that God's teaching you in the midst of that? One of my favorite kind of memories of, of watching Paul was when he won two big 12 championships and I wasn't really on the staff, you know, and just I had so many people kind of ask me like, oh, are you, do you miss it? Are you like sad? And I was like, sad, what are you talking about? Like, I'm so, uh, it was just, it was so exciting to watch him lead that team and those teams. And I'm just really realizing there's something about Paul's personality that is very different than mine. I'm a spaz. I'm like, Wah. you know, like, and he's very, he's very steady and not so up and down. And just watching his steadiness really taught me through just my own leadership is that the people around you need to see that, need to feel that is, is emotionally steady. I mean, he's like that with our children and with our family. And so I really, I think God really used that time to, to kind of hone in my emotions a little bit and to learn how to be a little bit more steady in, in, in my own life, in my own emotional ups and downs and, and just leading a group, you know, and, and what that looks like. So that was, that was really big for me. And then I think, you know, when, when Paul was still in the midst of, um, of, of coaching, I was leading kind of the, the, what we called the little bears soccer camps. And after a while I became kind of bored with just teaching soccer skills to kids. I just, I really was like, I'm missing such a big piece here for, for 
what what this actually is all about, what sport can be all about, the platform that we can use to teach children, you know, greater lessons in sports. And and so that was slowly the birth of Warrior Way is I wanted to be able to use all my experiences as an athlete where, where my relationship with Christ was like my lifeline. There are times, you know, when when I, you know, shattered my jaw in a soccer game when I when I tore my knee when I broke my nose when I was sitting on the bench and what after being drafted super high and being like what is going on you know when I made a huge mistake that cost our team the the championships like those moments Christ was my lifeline and and like just hanging on you know to him and but also really believing that man I have access to Jesus in my in my sport. I have access to the how to put on the mind of Christ, to be a warrior, to be a mental warrior, to be mentally steady. So for me, I wanted to start to teach that to kids, uh, especially kids that grow up and and they're like, "Oh, I'm a I'm a Christian athlete." Well, what's that really mean? You know, what's it mean to play with that tenacity and that passion when you step onto the field? And that that draws people to you and and makes makes people say, gosh, I I want to know more about that kid. Like, how do they play that way? Mm. And so that really became a huge passion of mine, because just a quick side note, I really I became a Christian by watching somebody play soccer in a certain way. Nobody told me a Bible verse or or gave me a Bible. I was watching somebody play in a certain way with just like it was magnetic i i can still remember it and um later asking him he was one of my coaches how can i play like that like it was very selfish in my mind i just was like i want to play like that how do i play like that and it gave him a window of opportunity to talk to me about what it what it means to have a relationship with christ and what christ can do in our sport and and how to really you know play our sport alongside like the maker of this world. And it was, it was life changing for me. So I'm now very passionate in teaching kids. What does it mean to be a Christian athlete? And it doesn't just mean we have to be nice and shake a hand and help people up and not swear. It's so much greater than that. And so I, I love to teach athletes the so much greater than that. Um, Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. And I, I still remember you know, the I, I laugh because when I was at Baylor, when I had Malia there, um, the first time I met Paul, actually. And I remember watching you guys together on the field and Marcy, and, and you kind of described the podcast a little bit too there. I'm kind of the spaz of the podcast and Paul is the calm amongst the storm, you know, which is, you know, why, why you know, people probably listen is for Paul's smooth, silky voice. but. You know, that's a whole different conversation. But, you know, you're sitting there on the field. You're like, not by my, not by by the spirit. You're like yelling at the verses, you know, in the minutes of coaching. And Paul's like just with his clipboard over there, you know, making some notes or just doodling. I don't know what he was doing, but he was just chilling over on the side watching. Just watching, you know, (laughs) just like checking it all out, making sure everything's good. And then, you know, but it was it was really cool to see that because, again, it's a team. It's a team effort. And, you know, I'm. (laughs) And so, so the last thing before we move on to the next thing is, is, uh, just on that note, how has life changed with you in your home since Paul has become a celebrity as the co-host of how soccer explains leadership? I mean, that, that's what everyone wants to do. I mean, is, is he the same at home as, as, you know, or has he changed since fame has hit him? He's, he's the same. I mean, he's um, steady Eddie. He's, okay. um, <laughs> he's, he's exactly he, he's, what you see is what you get. And, um, I'm, I try to change a little bit, but I'm still spaz. So, you know, we're, we, we're still a good team, but yeah, life has been great. I mean, you know, like every family that has four children that are ever growing and, and boys, especially our house is wild. There's never a dull moment, but we're we're blessed and, and thankful for those um, moments. You remind me of that, Paul, when we can't get the kids to to bed, that we're blessed. Okay, just remind me of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, for sure. Or yeah, can't, but get them, I, can't get them in I, bed, can't get them out of bed. 
I think we're just, you know, we're ever changing and growing what we're doing and always trying to just do the work. You know, yep. I love the verse, do the work and be strong and courageous or be strong and courageous and do the work. So, you know, we're just doing the work, putting our heads down and just driving forward and trying to do our best with what we've got. And yeah, we're thankful. You know, we've talked a lot about this on the podcast, Phil, and we may dive into it later, but the whole like building a team is so important, right? Like just a staff. And I think that yep. one thing that we've been blessed with is no matter what our titles were, our roles were pretty much the same, mm -hmm. you know, whether yeah. at the end of it, it just came down to like, okay, she's not on the sideline, but we'd had those conversations at home, you know? So it, it was really more about like, okay, what everybody else saw our titles change, mm -hmm. but our roles really never changed as a team. Yep. And that that runs is, is true even even through now even the stuff that i do with you know srusa you know i run things by marcy and she has opinions and you know yep. my steadiness sometimes can get me in trouble sometimes i need a little kick in the pants to to and and you know from from one of my the spasms in my life um yes. to get me going a little bit so that balance is 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 huge when you're and we're talking to young coaches about building your staff like you don't need a bunch of mini me's around you you know you're really not going to be able to accomplish as much so I'm sure we'll dive into that a little bit. And this is going to be a more of a difficult interview because like I have probably things to say on some of these things, but I'm going to try to be quiet um, on some of it. But Marcy, we've talked a little bit about kind of what you're doing and I want to, and, and how you got to what you're doing, but I want to dive in a little bit of like, what is, what is your personal why? Like, why would you say you do what you do? What is to the core? What is your, what is your why? And why do you, why do you do what you do? What is kind of life purpose, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, I think we all have an identity of like why we're supposed to be here and what our what our identity is in the kingdom, right? And I think mine is really teaching about faith and sport. Like since I was a young, younger kid after I, I came to know Christ and really from there on, like I think that's my personal mission is to use sport as a as a platform to, you know, even do kingdom training on the soccer field with kids to produce kingdom living off the field. It's a, it's a way for me to be able to reach um, kids I wouldn't normally be able to reach, to serve, to, to just, yeah, I think that's my personal why is to really teach about faith and sport. And I think that's really my purpose here on earth, as well as to raise these four boys up. So. And I think that as people, like the people that know you, like just feel your passion for that when you have an opportunity to speak into people. And sometimes it's not even a platform where you're invited to speak on something. Sometimes it's just a conversation with, you know, a random person in, at a school or a mom who you just feel needs encouragement. I mean, it's just really a, an amazing gift that God has given you to be able to speak into people in a way that, that kind of fuels their passion for things. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a really, it's an amazing gift that, that you have. And it's cool to, to, to kind of come alongside that. But if I wasn't your husband, you know, that, that is something that, you know, I hear all the time about you. It's like, yeah, I agree with that, but like I'm her husband, but, uh, that passion that you, that you push out there to folks is just, it's, it's contagious. It's, it's a spark that creates a flame in a lot of people. So keep up the good work, kid. Good stuff. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you know, I'm kind of a third wheel in this interview right now. I don't know. I feel like there's this is like a Is this date. what online dating is I, like? I don't, I don't like know. Cool. I never did it. it. You know, we were, <laughs> I was, I was well past, you know, it did not even close. I don't know. I feel a little awkward sometimes right now. That's all I'm going to say. It's getting kind of romantic. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> all right, Marcy. So, um, uh, you know, now you're, you're, you did, you know, you're doing Warrior Way now. You're raising the four boys. But let's talk a little bit about Warrior Way. You talked a little bit about it in the, in the offseason talk as far as, you know, kind of the principles that we talked about. So we can, we can, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, put that in the show notes for that. You can go back and listen to that fully. So we don't need to get into all the details and the nitty gritty. We can kind of remind people what it's about, but then go back and I strongly encourage you folks, go back and listen to those. You know, we'll have, I forget exactly what episode numbers they were, but there were two of them back in, you know, somewhere in the first hundred. So that gives you a little bit to go through. Just, uh, but we'll have that in the show notes. But, you know, what are you doing now with Warrior Way? Warrior Way gives, we talk about, we allude to it a lot on the podcast, but we don't talk about it in depth. So can you just share about what you're doing there in Waco, what you're doing internationally? And then we'll, uh, we'll talk about, you know, the Middle East work here in a little bit. 
For sure. Yeah. Warrior Way, you know, our focus was really started in Woodway, which is where we live and, and, you know, doing some camps in Chicago, doing some camps in Dallas and with some Dallas teams. And it was really a a way where I was going to be able to teach kids, young athletes, some of these principles and how to put on the mind of Christ. And there's so many Bible study things out there where it's like, okay, you, you know, you read your Bible study, you go play the sport, and then that's that. And I really wanted to teach kids a way to think differently on the field to be able to think God's word while they're actually playing the game. Like, I'm feeling anxious. How do I combat those feelings with God's word? I'm feeling afraid. I just missed a shot on an open net. What do I do with my my thoughts right at that moment? So Warrior Way was really a way to do that. And I was really happy just in my comfy little house in, in Waco until I wasn't one day when, when God really showed me like, hey, you're, you're serving and you're, you're teaching these kids that can afford your programming. And, you know, which are really a lot of privileged families, right? That can afford programming. And what about, what about all the kids that can't, you know? And that was when I had really thought and prayed through it. And I started a nonprofit arm of Warrior Way, which is called Warrior Way Gives with the hopes that we could give the same product to the world, you know, give it locally, give it globally. And to be able to, you know, share faith and sport and the love of Jesus Christ with under-resourced and overlooked communities, both locally and around the world. And I wanted to be able to scholarship kids. I wanted to be able to reach communities in Waco that, you know, I, I may not be able to normally reach. I wanted to be able to go overseas and, and serve there. I wanted to find overlooked communities that nobody paid attention to and find a way to bring our soccer programs into those communities. So it was really, you know, God showing me something is I always would say to my players when I coached, I'd say, you have to reach beyond your grasp in everything you're doing. You got to reach beyond your grasp. And, and I, I really was like, wait, I am not doing that. I'm comfy in Woodway. I'm just, you know, doing my thing. And then I really realized this is the push that I need to make. I need to get out of this little bubble zone. And, and so we started growing Warrior Way Gives. It was a arduous process of creating a, creating a nonprofit. Sometimes I was like, what am I doing? This is not in my wheelhouse. And that's where Paul came in a lot. And my sister, Maggie, was a huge help in just creating, creating our nonprofit and giving me advice on that. And, but then, you know, through every step, I got a little stronger. I got a little bit, you know, more knowledgeable about what I wanted to do. And like, I could just see through each time I took a step forward, God kind of just cleared the, cleared the, the kind of all the bushes or whatever, you know, you can kind of see a little bit clearer as you're walking forward. And I've just, man, it's, it's been such a lesson in trust and such a lesson in like, I'm going to just take a step. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to step, take a step Lord. And it's been a really beautiful process just to be, I'm humble to go through it. And, um, just it's, it's brought me a lot closer to, to the Lord as well. So. Yeah, that's what I've noticed a lot doing nonprofit work for the last 15 years or so is God usually doesn't show you the, he might show you the whole picture. Like he might show you the, the puzzle box, so to speak, but then I'm going to totally mix analogies here, but that's okay. Or metaphors, whatever. But he basically shows you the next breadcrumb. Yeah. And he goes, that's where, you know, that's kind of the vision, but all you need to see right now is this, because otherwise you're going to get lost in that. And that's. I, I've, I still am struggling with that because um, it takes a lot of patience, which is not my strong suit. Yes. But, um, but that it's kind of that next breadcrumb. What's the next breadcrumb? And, you know, he, he promises to be the light unto our path, not to the entire journey. Right. And so that's, that's what, what do we, what do we need? And I, I love, I love hearing that kind of from you on that now. So that led to, as you said, you know, you kind of got past comfortable, right? We say most of the great things in life come just on the other side of comfortable. So you're on the other side of comfortable and then the opportunity in Guatemala comes up. Can you just talk about that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, beyond comfortable, 
being comfortable is is amen to that because th these are areas like I was I wasn't comfortable at all. But Guatemala, I had been taking teams to Guatemala at Baylor just through FCA's ministry. But I really, as as I've been doing ministry work, I didn't want to just continue to go like wide. And I I even didn't really like the word. We're going on just a mission trip. We're going to go to, I remember my first trip to Guatemala being like, oh, we're going to Guatemala. We're like saving Guatemala, you know, and, and just like, I look back and I laugh at that because I really realized over a period of time, an investment from Warrior Way gives going to Guatemala continuously two times a year, at least, is that every time that we, we go to the same communities and we build relationship. And it's really about building relationship and it's about assessing needs. Where can we best serve these young children, these young girls and boys and, and their coaches? How can we walk alongside these coaches that, you know, they want, if we can train up these coaches to teach about faith and sport, then they can teach those to the, those same lessons to the communities. And so just I think Paul and I always say we want to go deep, not wide. Like we we want to be able to really put our our roots in in these different communities that we've been going to serve in Guatemala and develop relationships with, and we call them partners. They're our partners, mm -hmm. and it's been so neat just seeing the growth from. You know, we had we did a tournament about a year ago, and there was I remember there's you know one girl out there one little girl and us saying, hey, we also want to be pioneers for the women's game and telling our partners, we've got to, there's girls that want to play soccer, guys. Like they're like, we need to create some teams for these young girls to be able to play on. And this past, this past time that we went to Guatemala, having eight little girls teams play was just you know, it was fascinating yeah. to, to be able to see these little girls have opportunity to feel empowered, to feel strong, to feel beautiful. Those are the, those are the things that we're trying to, to, to kind of push into their souls and their spirits that you are worth it. You are, yeah. you, you are worthy, you know? Yeah. So it's been, that has been such a fun journey. We're going to this year take that tournament and we're going to create a league for these five communities. Mm. And so a place where they can now play monthly and be discipled monthly. And I just love that we've been able to provide jerseys and cleats and balls and equipment and really be able to, but also deeper. I mean, one of the, the biggest things that the communities have talked to us about is, you know, the greatest gift you've given us is, the, is showing up and being yeah. present. And I, I remember that wherever I go, even into different Waco communities, I'm like, it's just about being present for this, this short amount of time to be fully here. So that's been, that's just been such a great, great gift for us yeah. to be able to be a part of that. That right there, folks, if you go back and listen to that, that really is a, just a great kind of microcosm of the conversation we have about short-term missions. Because, in, you know, and that's something we talk a lot about in the orphan care space, particularly going to visit orphans because there's so much damage you can do. And, then, and even in communities, when we come in, we can do a lot of damage. And usually when that happens is when we go in with, we're going to save the world. We're going to yes. save Guatemala. We're going to save whatever. And we go in with a, this is what we are going to do. And as I talk to people, we, when we focus on what we are going to do rather than who we are going to be, we miss everything. And when we go in and we can just be children of God, we can be Imago Dei going to visit other Imago Dei. We are, we are the image of God. We are all of that. And we are going to just become friends yeah. and going to connect and do life together. And when we go with that, like, what does that look like? Just like you would with your neighbor who you're going to meet for the first time. You're going to do life together. You're not going to help them, quote unquote. You're going to just get to know them. And when we go with that, then, oh my gosh, the magic happens and, and right. all these amazing things can happen in the context of relationship as it should do in all our relationships, right? So that's something that I loved hearing in that answer. You didn't say those words, but that's what was spoken in the midst of that. And uh, I just love hearing that great example of, of that shift 
too, because so often it's usually people coming in and telling people not to do something. But that was something that you recognized and realized over the course of a relationship and seeing what it could what it could do. You know, along the same lines, I mean, are she just pushing into more about how you know, we, we had this idea of what programs were going to look like in these communities, right? And then we realized, okay, like that may not be what the community needs. Talk a little bit about how, you know, you've implemented these ideas of like, really, how are we, how are you listening to these communities to figure out like, okay, what, what exactly is it that these communities need and how are you figuring out that and not just like taking a group of people and rushing into an area and doing this programming that you do in, in Woodway, but figuring out what these different communities, even, even the thing, how Guatemala evolved from taking college soccer teams to play with teams to minister to now taking groups that range from, you know, boys and girls, men and women, ages six to 75. Like how are, how are you navigating finding out what these communities need? Cause I think that could be really important for people who are like, man, I really want to serve. I, I have these ideas, but like we said, you, it's not yeah. plug and play. How are, how are you yeah. navigating those things? Yeah. I mean, I think Paul, it's probably something I've learned a lot from you is that I think I am a person that is like, I'm trudging. I'm just going forward with everything I got. And I'm like, we're doing it this way, you know? And I think, um, some of your, by the way, some of your former players, if they're listening, just had PTSD from that moment, but go ahead. <laughs> <keep going. laughs> but I think, um, you know, kind of watching Paul's patience and ability to listen. And I'm surrounded by some young coaches that have that same quality, just listening. I mean, one of my top warrior way coaches, he's slow to do a lot of things. And I realized like, he's just listening, you know, and I'm just mm -hmm. wanting to talk. And so I think really developing relationship, like you said, we have to really get to know the communities we're working with. We have to see, ask them what their needs are. We may think their needs are like a hundred jerseys and they may be like, we just want you to show up and run a soccer clinic with these kids. One of the, one thing that was really neat is I had met with our partners and they said, for these young girls that had an opportunity in our past trip to sit with a lot of young, strong females that we brought from the United States to Guatemala, they said for a lot of these young girls, it was just the highlight of their year to be able to sit and share. And I mean, we had some in-depth conversations from you know, I mean, suicide and sex and drugs and different things like these in-depth vulnerabilities from these young women to be able to sit and share with us. And so now as I'm looking at this next summer, I'm like, you know what, we're going to, I want to go to, to that orphanage. I want to sit with those girls for longer than a day. I want to be able to have some time with these girls that, that, you know, we bring our team and we can really sit and, and spend more than just a few hours where we can pour into them and share with them. So I think it's the ability to listen, which is not my best quality. <clears throat> so I've had to learn, I've had to learn that along the way. And I've had to learn that in my Waco programs as well, because there's a lot of neighborhoods we're going into that, you know, I had never even been to before. I'd never been to a Stella Maxi's apartment, government housing apartments, and just quite intimidating the first time I was there and just being like, okay. And, and I realize now it's just being, being who you are, loving mm -hmm. people, showing them that you are for them. We all need people to just sometimes believe in us to, to just say, Hey, you know what? Phil, I know you can do that. I believe in you. Even if I may, maybe don't, like by you hearing me believe in you, you're like, okay, yeah, I can do this, you know? And we all need people to believe in us. I know I do. And I, I know a lot of the young people I work with do. So, yeah, that's really good stuff. And, you know, and I remember you, you as you're talking about all that, my daughter, Malia, when she was nine, we went down to Honduras. And she did a soccer clinic for the eight, seven, six-year-old girls. And she put it on start to finish. I, I said, you get to do it, whatever you want to do. And so she brought the drills. She drew it all up. And those girls still talk about it. And those girls after that, they didn't ever play with the boys until after that. And then they, they did. And, and it was like, and a lot of them were better, especially at that age, as we know, you know, at the younger ages, a lot of times the girls are just whooping up on the boys. 
because they grow faster and so on and so on. So it was just super cool because one of the things we talk about in the context of orphan and vulnerable children is, is discipleship and manhood and womanhood is one of the key things that we need to be doing to break cycles. Because in these communities, in the U.S., we don't see it as much. It's, it's still, we need it here, but it's, we pretend like we don't. But it's so obvious when we go to other places that a lot of times these women, young women, they're taught that you're just a baby factory. Yeah. Not necessarily, yeah. they don't say those words, but that's what they see and that's what's modeled. So for them to hear, like, you actually not only have worth, but you are created for amazing things. You have good works that God has created for you before you were even born. Like, these are things that when they hear this, it's like, what? Yeah. It, it's yeah. so foreign. And when we're able to come in and not just to say the words, but to be able to have models of that, they see something they've never seen and never heard. And then they hear, that's you too. They're like, what? Yes. And so to be able to speak that into them, that truth that is truth, because they're hearing these lies and they, they see it every day lived out. And when we can come in and just give a glimpse of that, give a picture of that, and then be able to share that and to be able to promote that with the leadership there too, and just be able to disciple the men and the women there to be able to live out what they're supposed to be living out too. That it all that that's what it's it's slow. It's not immediate. It's not that quick shot in the arm. It's relationship. And so I, I love hearing that because that's the the long term legacy vision, as I see, that will outlive us too. Hopefully, that it's not about us. And that's what I hear going through there. Is that, is that something that if my, am I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I, I think that that's what I'm hearing here. Oh, you're right on there. And I think, you know, if anyone listens to this podcast and is, is like, man, I just want, I just want to go serve, you know, I want to take a step. I think that's God sometimes calling you to, to find a way to do that. You know, I know Warrior Way Gives, we're always putting together teams to take to Guatemala and you don't have to be a soccer person to come. I mean, this last trip, we took 32 people and we had, we had 13 young boys, which was really fun. But we also had a lot of people that they didn't have soccer experience or soccer knowledge. But I really believe every trip and every team you form to go serve, God uses everybody's giftings in different ways. And and I, I saw that so evident this last trip. It was such an intimate group. And God kind of used everyone's different giftings to be able to, whether it's making meals or whether it's collecting balls or whatever it may be, you're going to be used in, in the trip. So yeah. we love taking groups. All right. So there's obviously we could talk on and on about that. But I, I want to get into a little bit. We Paul and I mentioned because Paul was, I almost said complaining. He wasn't complaining. I was going to joke about that, but I didn't want to, sarcasm doesn't go very <laughs> oh, well. I know where you're going. But okay. he was talking about, you know, being able to, being able to hang out with his four boys while I you get were, to. yes, I you get, get to. to, you got to hang out with the four boys for an extended period of time because you were able to head over to the Middle East doing some military ministry, right? I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I think that's what it was about. So can you just talk about that, like the, how that opportunity came to be and what kind of on the other side of that, you're thinking, okay, maybe we can continue doing some of this stuff. Right. Yeah. I got a, I got a call from Armed Forces Entertainment. They were bringing a team over to the Middle East to just, you know, put on soccer camps and clinics and to play in with the troops and stuff like that. And I remember being like, oh yeah, like, I would love to do this, but like I kind of shot back an email. We we're about to go to spring break and they shot me back an email and, and and they were interested probably because it was World Cup time and there was no like better younger players than me to be able to go. No, just kidding. But so I had the opportunity to to go to the Middle East with my former teammate, Natasha Kai. She's an Olympic gold medalist. Sarah Huffman played in the pro leagues. And Ashley Nick played in the pro leagues as well. And they played on the youth national teams. Um, I had an opportunity to join this group to go to these Middle Eastern countries and different um, military bases. And I remember just these girls had all done these trips together before. So I was really nervous because I was like, man, I'm the old girl going with all these younger players. I've got to play in with like the military 
and just being a little bit intimidated, really nervous. Um, I'd never been to the Middle East before. And man, it was just, it was one of the top moments in my life, just mm-hmm. being able to go and be surrounded by the military and watch just the incredible sacrifice that they make for our country, the incredible sacrifice they make in their own lives and their families' lives. And I remember talking to, to talking to one of the colonels and just being like, oh, yeah, and I'm away from my family for two, you know, two weeks or whatever. And he had, he wasn't going to see his family for like six months. And he had young children, you know, and so just being just blown away by by watching the military in action and the kindness of of you know we we got to i we got to sit in with all these different groups we got to meet with the eod team which is aka we call them the bomb squad and they took us to the the desert and showed us kind of how how they look for you know bombs and how they set off bombs we we got to uh, meet with the the dog team where you know i don't know if that's what you call them but the <laughs> dog the bomb sniffing dogs one of them like where they they bite your arm yeah. and you know we got to meet with just all the tr- the different troops the the leaders so watching the way that that team works was fascinating and then um being able to put on clinics and bring them joy and and fun i i had my first slide tackle in like 10 years i hadn't you know, played in that type of soccer plane. And I went down for slide tackle and I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm 40 something and I'm slide tackling. But it was, it was fun. And then a really, a really key moment for me over there was I kind of had on my bucket list to go on a run in the desert. Like I wanted to do a 5k in the desert. So I asked a couple of the troops, I was like, does anyone want to go on a run with me in the desert? And I had a group of like, you know, seven, eight troops, a married couple, couple girls, couple guys. And so we went on, I think this was Kuwait. We went on a run in the desert. And during that run, I asked everybody, like each person to share like who they are, what, why they do what they do, like what their passion is. And it got to my turn, like everyone finished and they're like, what about you? And I had an opportunity to share a little bit about my faith and share what I, why I do what I do. And I remember one of the young men, he was a helicopter pilot. He looks at me and he's like, you know what, Marcy? Fort Cavazos is 40 minutes from your house in Waco. He's like, they are an overlooked community. It fits your mission statement. You know, you're there to serve under-resourced and overlooked communities. He's like, why don't you go to Fort Cavazos and put on soccer camps and videotape them and be able to send them off to their deployed parents, you know, or deployed mm. mom or dad. And, and he's like, cause there's no greater joy than getting to see your children happy when you are serving. And I was like, oh my gosh, great challenge. So I left that, that run. I was talking to my team of girls and I was like, man, such a great idea. I just don't know anyone at Fort Cavazos. I, I'll have to kind of try to find a way into Fort Cavazos. So that night, I kid you not, we walk out to this field to, to have a big, you know, big game, you know, with, with the troops. And there's probably 80 people out there. It was a huge group. And I just walk out there. I put the balls down. The first guy I see, I walk up to him and I go up and I shake his hand. I'm like, hello, sir. What's going on? We start to talk. And I was like, yeah, where, where are you stationed in the United States? He's like, Fort Cavazos. I was <laughs> like, Really? And so I tell him my little spiel about my run. And then um, he's like, oh, man, my wife is the community outreach person (laughs) at Fort Cavazos. So he gives me her name, her number, et cetera. I get back to Waco. And now in January, we'll be having our first soccer camp at Fort Cavazos. That's awesome. And like I said before, that was just a God leaving that completely. Yeah. Following the next breadcrumb. And, you know, I still don't know where it'll lead. This will be our first one. So I'm excited about it and just trying to take the next step that's right in front of me. So, yeah, I love that. I love that. Those divine appointments, right? That's that, that's basically been my prayer the last however many months every day. I kind of write three things that will make today great. And I'm it's to be able to see the divine appointments that God has for me because 
he has them for us. So often we miss them because we're so quote unquote busy with, with our stuff. But something else that stuck out there is folks, I don't know if you, if it just don't miss this, but this, this will give you insight into Marcy. Paul knows where I'm going with this, that, that on her bucket list, most people's bucket list would be like, for me, it was go to old Trafford and actually be able to see a match at old Trafford. You it's to run a 5k in the desert. <laughs> So I don't want to run a 5K anywhere, but, you know, you want to do it in the debt, of course. I mean, because that makes sense. I mean, it's probably on many people's bucket list, just just not mine. I don't know, Paul, it's probably on yours, too. And you're just so, uh, so jealous that you were not yeah. able to do that with Marcy. That activity is in a bucket, but not on a bucket list for me, <laughs> yes, uh, if that yes. makes sense. So, yes, I uh, got you. Yeah, that definitely stands out. And then just another, you know, another testimony of like, hey, we don't always know where we're going, right? And and we can become too busy to to listen and too busy to 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 hear what's going on. But when we sit in that moment and open our hands, you know, God will speak and He'll make things happen the way He wants to. But like you said, Phil, if we're too busy and too scheduled to have our own ideas, you know, things don't really happen um, the way they should. So I I love the story of that. I love the opportunities that that Marcy was able to have to to do that because that you know we probably you know more than likely wouldn't be serving Fort Cavazos even though it is right down the street and it is an overlooked community uh, around us that probably hadn't thought about even though we have military in our family and it's not like we're blind to the service that our that our our troops do for us on a daily basis so it's really just mm -hmm. a cool testament to to that so anything else on the on on that, if if not, Mars, I want to I want to dive in a little bit into your career a little bit because I think it helps helps people realize like how we get to where we are, knowing who we are, right? And right. some of those things are just moments in our lives that kind of define how we end up where we are. And you talked a lot about at the beginning, just through your story about you know things that happened. You know, you talked a little bit about changing schools. You talked about injuries, but you know what? If you had to look back over over your soccer career, specifically your playing career, was there a defining moment? And what was that defining moment that was impact, really impactful in your life? And what are, what are you using now from those lessons that you learned right. in, that, in that moment? Yeah, I mean, I think where I kind of led in the beginning was going from like this big family to Wisconsin, to SMU, to Germany, to playing pro in Atlanta, to going or going to Germany, Atlanta, going with the United States national team, just this ever shifting group of people where, you know, you, learning how to like be yourself, but be humble in those, those different uh, moments of just meeting people and just trying to see people of like, you don't always know what people are carrying. You don't always know. And Paul, you remind me that you remind this, you remind me of this a lot when you're like, hey, Marcy, like, you don't know what this this person is carrying right now. Don't be slow to judge, you know. And I think, um, you know, even going back to the the military trip, walking into the circumstance where, you know, I'm walking in with Natasha Kai. I hadn't seen her for years, um, you know, and she's she's got tats all over the place. And I and and then you know Ashley Nick is just you know she's this beautiful young like blogger and Sarah Huffman I was so intimidated in a weird way to like walk into this group of girls like wanting to be accepted wanting to to be able to be a part of their their group and just really realizing again is it's just a different group of people that you're trying to be intentional with knowing them like, tell me about yourself. Tell me like about your life. I want to know you, you know? And I think that is an important piece of, of just what I've learned in sports is that people want to be known. They want to share. They want to not just be, you know, surfaced over like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Like, but even coaching players, I think my best coaching was when I knew my players the best. And the players that would go through a wall for me or players that we spend intentional time talking on deep levels about faith, about their life, about their boyfriends, about their families, you know, and th those are the, the times where we, we grew these 
tight, deep bonds that you go back to these weddings and you get to see them getting married and get to see them having children. And it's just a, such a gift. So I think the greatest lesson that I've learned through all these years of sports is just being really intentional people and, and trying to go deep, you know, trying to go deep, not wide, trying to know them and also being vulnerable with your own life and sharing, you know, sharing about your ups and downs and your struggles. Um, you know, I think that's a big piece of ministry. We want to go in to different places and be like, Jesus is the way, you know, and I just don't think that for me, that doesn't, that's not the way I do things. I want to, I want to listen. I want to, you know, on that run in the desert, I had the opportunity to hear all these different faith backgrounds and life walks and family dynamics. And it was just that run goes down as one of the most impactful moments of my life as, a, as an athlete and as a coach. So, yeah, that's probably some of the key, the key lessons that I've learned in coaching and sport. You know, I feel like we, on this show, we, we come back a lot to that relationship with, with leadership, right? We talk, we talk a lot, Marcy and Phil and I talk on the podcast, but Marcy, you and I talk a lot about that relationship piece. And it seems to be, you know, we hear about it at times, but it seems to be like, I think there are coaches that miss, miss that, right? They have the, they have the soccer relationship, right? Like, Hey, like I know you as a player, I know what your strengths and weaknesses are on and off the field, but you know, I think what, what you're hitting at and what we try to hit at a lot is like, I think coaches miss the boat when, you know, they're not pouring into the off field relationship, you know, and yeah. you even said it like the girls that would run through a wall for you are the ones that, you know, that you had that deeper relationship with. And it wasn't a one way relationship. It's a two way relationship. And sometimes it is just about like knowing what's going on in their life so that you can better serve them on the field too. Right. And I think that's something that, you know, I, any chance I have to say to coaches, like, don't, don't miss that relationship opportunity with these players. It's not a, it's not a, this shouldn't be a transactional relationship. And, and sometimes transactional coaches are doing that because they want to have success on the field. Because as coaches, as we know, professionally, if you're not winning, you're going to lose your job. But I think if we're focused too much on the transactional piece of it, we missed the relational. And I believe, and I think Marcy, you would agree with this, the relational piece can actually help you be more successful. I mean, do, right. I know what you think, yeah. but do you agree with that? And how, what would you add? Yeah. To yeah. And I think, you know, the hard part, I mean, Paul, like let's face it, why we slowly got out of maybe college coaching at the time was just that it became harder to probably have that in-depth relationship with players because things have just changed in college athletics. They've changed in, yeah, the college sports in general, it's become much more a business. And for me, that's never why I got into coaching in the first place, because I know I could go back and get a college coaching job. And I'm not saying that God won't lead me to that one day. But I think without that piece, I just can't do my job well. And the, you know, if we're if we're in the industry to create young, young women that can grow and flourish and pour into them. And then we're not really able to do that. You know, you're, everything is robotic. You know, you can't at, should I ask about this or should I not? Am I, am I gonna, will I get in trouble if I do this or not? Like it just becomes so much more transactional and the opportunity to really pour into the, the person isn't really there as much. So, yeah, I think that's so accurate. I know the, the coaches that, you know, believed in me as a person first and really poured into my spiritual, emotional well-being. Those are, those are the coaches I would do anything for. You know, I wanted to run through a wall for. And, and they're, they're also life relationships, people that they're still in your life. You know, I love that there's the Julie Jameses and the, you know, the Caitlin Amoses like that. We were able to be a part of like when she had a heart transplant and we're getting the community to rally around it. And Julie James being able to watch her career. And, you know, I could go on and on about players mm -hmm. that I've loved so much and just had an opportunity to be a part of their lives and still am still consider them friends. So. That's so cool. I, I, I love hearing the answer there about defining moment because if you listened back to that and didn't hear the question, you would have no idea it was about soccer. And I love that. 
like you could have been describing your career in whatever, and it's about the people. And I think that that is what people miss and what is just tragic. I think about the transfer portal and about the way college soccer has become, as you've talked about is people aren't just the, the, the percentage of people who stay at a school for four years and play for all four years and, and are the team together with people and developing those relationships with coaches and players is less and less and less. And it's just, it, it's, it's, it just bums me out. You know, it just bums me out because I think people are missing so much. And I think coaches aren't, are almost being hardened to it as well, where they're, if they are those type of people, either they're getting out of it or they're just like, well, I can't, I can't do that because there's very few people who, and there are still are exceptions. I mean, we just re recently sure. interviewed Kevin O'Brien and to hear mm -hmm. Kevin talking about it, I, I see that there. There are some exception schools as well. Patrick Gilliam at D3 schools often get players there who are able to, you know, they are coming for different reasons, but there, there are exceptions to the rule. But I think for the for higher sure. level, you're not, you're not seeing that as much, which is, which is a bummer, but that's a whole different conversation. All right. So we have, you're talking about relationships and I want to get into these. We're, we're going to do this kind of in, we don't normally do this, but this is a special thing that I want to make sure we, we, uh, we hear some of these answers. So we're going to do kind of like a speed round here where we're going to do it and we're not going to have a lot of commentary on Paul and I said, Paul and I, we can talk about it. Uh, you know, when we do a post-match show or something, but, but what are, you know, so these next, like we have two questions we ask at the end of everybody. And then these are a couple of questions. I'm curious from you because you are so big on relationship. And so what are, you've played with a ton of great players. You know, I just remember that Atlanta beat team that you were on that Becca was the chaplain for, and it was like, it was loaded, right? You had, you know, one of the players of the century on that team, right? So like pretty good, pretty good players, but you've also played on a national team. You played over in Germany and you played for great, you know, high school, college teams, right? So who were one or two of the, let's just say one, who was the best leader if you had to say that best you played leader. with? Best, best leader that leader. you played with and what set her apart from the rest? Man, I'd, I'd have to probably go with Charmaine Hooper. I mean, just from the Atlanta beat and she was just a warrior. She led by example every single day and how she took care of herself, her body, came alongside her teammates. Yeah, got it done. I mean, she was, she was just a tremendous leader. So I'd say Charmaine Hooper. I loved being her teammate. This is a speed round. I don't I like feel it. speed. I love it. I know Paul was supposed to come right on top of it. I was ready for him, but. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I'll say, because I know, I know Charmaine, <laughs> you know, and I think when you think about leaders, I want to dive into the, to her a little bit, her personality. Yeah. Like, what was it about? Like, she was very direct too, mm -hmm. right? Like talk about the contrast of Charmaine, because some people are going to hear Charmaine Hooper and go, man, that girl was tough. She was mean. Like yeah. she was like, they don't. They don't know Charmaine's full context of who she is yeah. and have played with her or lived with her in her life. But like, give us the contrast of like, yeah. you talk about like she, she led by example, how she did things, but talk about how she would speak into things, how she could be harsh, but she could also have the, the shadow of that too. As a yeah. I mean, I think people that probably, there's probably a great deal of people that did not like Charmaine for sure. And they were probably her opponents because most of the time, if you were Charmaine's teammate, you would, you were just, you loved it because yeah, she could be tough. She could, she'd be direct and, but she'd be the first one to, to also stay after practice to work with you on certain things. She would, you know, she was always constantly honing her own game, working on her finishing her, you know, and the girl scored so many different goals, you know, she would, you know, give you, she had such a serious personality on the field, but then off the field, she's so goofy. You know, she would be looking at like the, the paint color schemes on, at your hotel room or something. You know, she was so goofy and, um, but also her dedication to just her own personal taking care of herself. You know, I remember Charmaine traveling with like a, always a blender for her smoothies and giving you ideas on things. But I think at the end of the day, she respected just mental toughness so much. She was so behind. Like if you gave everything you had, she wasn't going to, she knew that, you know, that was, that was your everything, you know, and it's been fun watching her daughter be Charlie Codd be extremely successful at Notre Dame as a freshman. And it's been fun watching her. I wonder if she'll be better than Charmaine. I quite think she may. So we'll see. Yeah. 
And you know, and you know, when we talk with them, Chuck is going to ask, did you mention me? So she at least said, mention, oh, yeah. mentioned Chuck Codd because I said, did you mention me? And we'll usually say no, but now we yeah. can say yes. Chuck Codd was also a great soccer yeah. player too. Her dad. Yeah, Chuck was a husband. great soccer player. That's for so sure. So now that we transition to, to coaches. I met Chuck too, this, just so I can throw in the Chuck love. You did. You did. So <laughs> you're not okay, really, the, we go. you're not really the third wheel. You're really part of yeah. the family. And here, he, so. he won't care that I did that, but I did it anyway. We met, I think on <laughs> two occasions. So that was, yep. he's. And, going to mean a lot, I'm sure. Totally, totally. And part of this speed round, let's speed round into the next question because you have not only played for, but coached with some amazing coaches in your career. I think, take me out because yeah, I know Yeah, you can't say I Paul. Can't you can't say, say me. Paul. You can't say me. That's the obvious answer. We're not about the obvious answers here on this podcast, but talk about like the, the, best, the best coach that you either coached with or played for or both and tell us, you know, more about that relationship and what what you learned from that that relationship and how much that 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 coach influenced you in that yeah. in, in your own coaching in life. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing I've learned now that I'm older is that every coach has their flaws. Like we all, you know, when we're young, you may think a coach is terrible because of certain things, or that you may think they're awesome because of certain things. And you get older and you look back and you're like, yeah, there was these things about this coach that I, I'm going to take and I'm going to put into my bucket of, of coaching. And, and these things I'm going to just leave to the side, you know? And I think, I mean, there's people that are doing the same with us. Like, I really liked yeah. that about Marcy. This was a little bit, nah, I'm going to leave that there. But yeah, I mean, Brett Hall was a big part of my life. He, he, he coached me since I was 10 years old. He taught me a lot about how to do hard things and how to kind of reach beyond my grasp. He, I think one thing I was always kind of known for, which I, you know, I look back, I'm like, whatever, but um, a lot of players thought I was extremely mentally tough and, and kind of a warrior on the field, so to speak. And it's, it's so funny because I look back and I see what a role faith played in that because I was always so internally anxious and afraid. And I still am about really, I got to speak. I got to do a podcast. I got to go coach this group. I got to step in Guatemala into that group member, Paul, of all mm. males that had never been coached by a female before. Yeah, and, you know, you had men's this, team. a professional men's team. I'm like, I'm stepping in and coaching these, these, these guys. And, you know, I think one called me honey on the way in, you know, and you're like, oh my <laughs> God, I'm going to lead this session. So I think <laughs> that's where sort of like, I, I look back and that was a big piece that I think Brett kind of helped me learn is that, again, it's not soccer and Jesus. It's learning how to do our life in, in worship to him, how to play our sport for him, how to parent for him, how to, you know, do all these things we're doing where it's not about us. It's about making him bigger and you smaller. And so I think, I think Brett was a big piece of that. You know, I love that it was your coach when you were a kid. Like that is so cool. Like I, I think that that is so encouraging to hopefully should be for people listening out there. Like you're impacting people if, oh, yeah. if you quote unquote just coach, you know, little girls with pug goals. Yes. You know, I like I remember those coaches like infinite patience that they had with my kids when they were little and, and like making a difference. I love it. Love it. That's so awesome. Okay. So we're going by, we, we do, we do the speed round really poorly. I'm going to tell you that right we're now. Bad like, at speed. We are we don't such do well a bad speed, speed round. round podcast, but that's okay. We're going to, we're going to redeem the speed round. We're bringing it back. We're bringing it back with these last few questions. All right. So you can expand on this a little bit. It doesn't have to be super speedy because I want to hear your answer on this. How do, how do you use the lessons you learn directly from the game of soccer in your marriage and parenting? Yeah, I think in my marriage, I mean, learning, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of obvious and cliche sounding, but learning how to be part of the team, learning to use your strengths to the very best in your family. You know, I think that that's learning. Always, I, I would say to players, what are you really good at? And make those things shine, you know, like on the field. 
And where do you really struggle and get a little bit better at those weaknesses? And so I think that's that's the greatest lesson in, in parenting and in marriage is where do I shine in our family? And then there's some big weaknesses I have. And how can I continue to work on those things so that they don't damage my family, my kids, et cetera? And so that's the, the greatest lesson probably in, in that. Is there part two to that question? Sorry. No, 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 that was it. And, you know, yeah, that was it. I think, I think part of that too, just cause I, I know you and I know your family, part of that accountability too, within your team, right. Of making sure yes. that, you know, you and I, I think do a pretty good job of holding each other accountable of like, Hey, here's some things that they need to continue to work on for our team. So just add that in there because it's lightning round. I wanted to add that in real, real quick. Yeah. Um, that was super but, fast. Good job. Super fast, super fast. So final, final question here, because as Phil likes to say, all good things must come to an end. And if we don't say that phrase, the podcast can't happen. So I've said that now. <laughs> final question, Marcy, what have you watched, read, or listened to that's most impacted your thinking on how soccer explains life and leadership? Hmm. Man, I should have prepared for that question a little bit more. Man, first this podcast, I got to say well, that. Course. Listening I mean, to you two. Yeah. And, ding, 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 ding. Know, Didn't even uh, coach that one. That was a good answer. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I think I think there's a lot of good books I've read. There's a, I mean, I, I don't know if you're looking for one specific thing, but I think to continue to always be curious and always be learning is really important. Whether it's like, how am I going to learn to deal with my teenage son right now? Like, man, I, I'm going to, I'm going to read, I'm going to talk to people about it. I'm going to learn how, how am I going to continue to grow our ministry in the East Waco, Estella Maxi communities? I'm going to talk to people that know that community. I'm going to learn, I'm going to be curious, you know? Um, so I think in general with reading, with learning, with listening, it's, it's not, not becoming stagnant. Again, I go back to where I started. You can, Hear that verse that says, be strong and courageous and do the work. Or you can go, I always flip it, do the work, and then you become strong and courageous. So for me, it's, it's, it's learning, listening, doing the work, and then al alongside that, becoming stronger and more courageous within what I'm, what I'm currently doing. So. All right. You know, Paul, do you have any, before we sign off, do you have any like feelings, immediate gut feelings of we we were able to do this in like, I mean, I know you're super proud of your your bride, so I we don't need to say that. But do you just, are you just like loving this? Do you go do you want to like go run a five k in the desert or something now because you're so psyched? <laughs> almost, almost, almost. Uh, okay. No, I mean by far, by far my favorite podcast we've ever oh, yeah. done. And, and that's, I'm, I'm not biased at all, but no, I think there's, there's some great stuff here. And again, like, like most of our guests, Phil, I mean, Marcy is one of those people that we could talk for hours about you mm -hmm. know, one topic and there's probably 10 topics we could dive into and have 10 different podcasts. And we have so many guests that are like that. And Marcy's just, you know, not because she's just, you know, she's my, she's on here because she's my wife, but because of how she does things and how she goes about things and how she leads people. You know, that's why she's on here. And I, I, I'm, there's no doubt in my mind that people are going to listen to this and get a lot out of it. And I'm just really, I'm encouraged once again by our guests today. But the good thing is I get to continue to have a conversation yeah. with this one day in and day out. So that's I appreciate true. Marcy taking time out of, I know everything that she's doing to, to jump on here with us, to share yeah. more with just our, our listeners, what she's doing and how we go about things and just helping to encourage young coaches, young players and, and leaders in, in, in life here. So Marcy, thank, thank you me. from the bottom of my heart for coming on. Well, thank and you I agree with for all having that. me. It's yeah, been a so, lot of fun today, so thank you. Well, good. That's what we <laughs> want to do. And thank you. I um, appreciate it. This makes me want to get Becca on the podcast, although I know she will <laughs> not want to do that. But yeah, I know. very much appreciate you. Very much appreciate all you're doing, your heart. I appreciate uh, you allowing Paul to take the time to do this podcast as well, because I know that that's not just something I love, but I know it's impacting a lot of people. I know it's a great, a great team that we have here. So I appreciate you on that. And yeah, thanks for, for, thanks for finally getting you on, you know, and finally making the time to be a part of this. Appreciate you. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, folks. Well, thank you for uh, being a part of this. Thank you for engaging. I do hope that you take what you're, uh, what you're learning on this and, and you actually use it. That's really the idea here is that we can take these things and not just oh, be inspired and be done, but to actually, she said, do the work and go out there and have this really something that you use in your life. And if you want to learn more about Warrior Way, we will have that, that uh, link on the, on the show notes. We'll also have the link to uh, Providence World and Coaching the Bigger Game there. And anything that you have a question about, you can, you can click on the link to my email and just shoot me an email about whatever, and we can, we can hopefully get that answered. If you have any guests that you want us to have on, share those with us as well. Rate and view the podcast if you, uh, if you have that, if you really like it, or even if you don't, you know, let us know your thoughts, whether you're on Spotify or wherever you're at, just go ahead and do that. But uh, as always, most importantly, we hope that you're taking what you're learning from the show. You're using it to be a better spouse, a better parent, a better player, better coach, a better leader in all that you do. And you continually remind yourself that soccer does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have a great couple of weeks.